This is episode, hard to believe, number 245 with artist Carl Bretzky. And we're going to talk about how light behaves, how paint, how to paint sunrises and sunsets properly, and a special palette to consider. Let's get started. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping. And if you want to know more about plein air painting, this is the place uh, to improve your painting, uh, to learn about it, the lifestyle, the mindset of the artist. Um, Welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, I started this, I was plein air painting, and I started plein air painting, and then I thought, well, you know, we need a magazine. So I started a magazine, then I started a conference, and we started the podcast. Anyway, uh, we have uh, massive amounts, like a couple of million downloads on this podcast. So thank you for that. People in, I think, 120 different places, countries. So um, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, Today's going to be a red letter day because our guest today is going to tell you some things you've never heard. I guarantee it because I had been painting for 20 years and I never heard them. (laughs) So you're going to like that. Uh, Coming up soon after the interview in the marketing minute, we're going to talk about pricing your artwork, how to get into art galleries and the stupid mistakes that artists make that create uh, irrelevance, make them irrelevant fast. These are important marketing principles. And by the way, the Plein Air Podcast is the number one art podcast two years in a row on Feedspot. Thank you for that. And Feedspot also just gave us top 25 art marketing, uh, business and marketing blogs on the web. So that's nice. Thank you very much for making that happen. So, you know, in, uh, let's see, in minutes, it's going to be May. You know what April brings, right? April brings showers. So May brings the plein air convention coming up in Denver. And yes, there will be flowers and everybody's going because it's the 10 year anniversary celebration. Uh, It's going to be five days, five stages, 80 top painters, probably close to 1200 people attending, uh, which seems like a lot, but it's actually a very intimate affair. Uh, And you're going to like learn from all these top artists. Uh, You're going to be painting together. It's, it's really a lot of fun to paint with, a thousand other people. It's so much fun. We're going to be painting in iconic spots like Rocky Mountain National Park, which by the way, national parks limit the number of people who can paint together in the parks. Uh, We had to get special permits. Took us uh, two years to get those. So you don't want to miss this one. Pretty cool. It's historic, right? Plenairconvention.com. And you can also attend online, of course, uh, and that you won't be able to go to the paint outs and you get the main stage, but you it's not the same, but it's also a great experience. If you can't make it, just go to plenairconvention.com either way. Okay, so this October, I uh, I don't know whether we even have a graphic for this yet, but this October, I've just announced I'm doing a special art collector trip. Uh, my magazine, Fine Art Connoisseur, always does these art collector trips, and a lot of painters go, and uh, they're just to die for. They uh, Don't die, but they're world class. And we love doing it. This year, we're going to go to Madrid and we're going to go to Stockholm. I think we're going to Stockholm first. There's so much art in those two cities, we can fill up a 10-day trip easily. So we're going to do that. And soon, I'm going to be announcing a uh, an international painting trip uh, that's for next spring. So you'll have to be thinking about that. Anyway, let's get right to it. We have an amazing guest with us, Carl Bretsky. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Thank you, Eric. Nice to see you, sir. Yeah, well, I'm back. <laughs> yeah. 
So you've been a busy guy. You uh, you've been out painting a lot. You you did um, a big event in Jupiter, Florida. Tell us all what you've been up to. Um, I actually cut back a little bit this year, but yeah, I probably do one plein air event every other month. I would guess. Um, it's a lot. Yeah, it gets to be a lot, but it's over a week each time, and um, yeah, but actually, it's good for me. I feel like if I don't paint in competition for a week straight every month or every two months, um, I I think my skills would get uh, diminished somewhat. It, it really forces me to paint outside. Well, you have a different mindset than most people because in your former job, if you if you screwed up, people would die. So yeah. I guess you like putting yourself under pressure. Well, I mean, I don't know if it feels like pressure. It's more like uh, doing homework on Sunday night. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know you have to get it done. But... Last minute cramming. Yeah. So tell uh, the people who are listening to this who might not have ever experienced being an artist in a plein air event, what are the things that you have to think about beforehand? What's, what's your process? Oh man, let's see. Um, so I, unless it's a local event, which there are just a handful, um, I fly. So I've got a, I've figured out how to do it in two suitcases. One is my studio and the other is all my other stuff. And um, you have to, you can't fly with turpentine. So I have to arrange that in advance and I have all my frames shipped in advance. So yeah, it takes a little bit of forethought, but um, after a few events, it's it's very knee jerk for me. I can do it quickly. So you have and, uh, you have framing supplies and hooks and all that stuff. What? How do you do? Um, it? Well, I'm fortunate. The framer that supplies my frames, he'll put all the hardware on for me, including yep. clips. So I don't have to think about that part. So you want to give him nice. a shameless plug? JFM. All right. But I use others as well. But uh, JFM more recently. Uh, but there's a lot of great ones out there. Uh, okay. Randy Higby out in California. Yep. Others. Yep. Both, both very good about frames. Yeah. Both of them. Yeah. And usually they're at the plein air convention. I don't know if they are this year or not. I know that I heard from at least one of them and said they were working on it. So I haven't actually heard. That yeah. would be nice. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you like the pressure. Uh, so you typically <clears throat> kind of go through, you know, the first day arriving at an event, what's the process like at one of these events? Yeah. Well, first day, they always do a kind of an orientation for new people, uh, but also a refresher for people that have been there before. Um, I actually like to go scout the first day as much as I can so that by the time you get a canvas stamped and you're ready to paint, I already know three paintings that I'm going to do. And uh, that, that really saves time. Otherwise, I think anyone, you're driving around looking for oh, places. You can drive for hours. And anyone that's done that knows that you'll drive around for an hour and you've seen a couple of things, but you want to just go that extra 10 miles just in case you see something better. And, then you and that just repeats itself until <laughs> hours have gone by. So, yeah, I, uh, I try to scout in advance. And that will include, I usually get there the night before, yeah. and I will actually spend that first night looking for night paintings. Uh, because by the time I'm done with the first day of painting, I'm pretty tired. And if I had to go search at that point, I think that would be a little more so difficult. So you typically so. do one daytime and one nighttime every day? Um, well, the other thing that I've been doing lately is I've been trying to spend more than one day on a painting. So okay. a, a typical night painting, I'll get it blocked in pretty well the first night. And because nighttime doesn't change very much from day to day, I can easily go back and keep working on the same scene. So yeah. that's one advantage of doing the night painting. But the other is that it gives me one more painting uh, that I can do. So I mean, most people I think do two, maybe three paintings a day during the day. And uh, this one just gives me one extra painting. So, so yeah, how many, like, by the end of the week, how many will you typically come out with? I bet you somewhere around 10. Yeah. Be a rough yeah. average. Yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, and then there's t talk about some of the events that, that are kind of standard. Uh, we haven't really ever talked about this on the podcast very much. And I think people okay. would be curious about it. The ones that I've done, you mean? 
Well, just to, you know, in general, what, in you know, general. what are some of the things they all do? Wait a minute. The things that they all do. Well, okay. Well, you know, um, like paint outs yeah. and. Yeah. So I guess standard would be, there would be uh, usually four days of painting, four or five with a gala at the end that they've marketed for the, the whole year so that you get a good turnout of patrons. And uh, during that gala, uh, they'll have the sale of your work and they'll also judge the work and have an award ceremony. And then somewhere within that week, there's usually a uh, quick paint, which mm -hmm. has become pretty standard for most events. And those are sometimes judged and other times not. But they're typically two hours, once in a while, 90 minutes. Uh, and it's shocking to me, but those quick paint paintings look like the, the one week long finished painting uh, quite often. It's just amazing what people can do in two hours. So, And do you think that's because they've been tuned up all week? Probably a little bit, but I think that they're just that good. I mean, I'm proud to be part of this traveling group of painters that do these events um, because they're all really good. We refer to them as gypsies. Gypsies, yeah, it feels like <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't tell people it's the traveling circus, but yeah, gypsies. <laughs> well, that's, that's a, um, you know, it can be a hard life, especially if you're driving. Um, and, and we <clears> both know people who, who will do 15 events a year and drive to every one of them and they never oh, see yeah. to spend any time at home it's it and you know the the for the people who listen who go to these events buy paintings buy paintings because you know these people do it not only for entertainment they do it because they want to make a living yeah i'd say there's a very good percentage of people that that is their living and uh any way they can save money by driving but driving is also nice because you have your whole studio supply with you but um but yeah, they count on sales and some uh, award money. So it's definitely a good thing to support if you're into the arts. Yeah, and once in a while you hear somebody say, you know, they, they did an event and nothing sold. And that's, that's not, not helpful. So that's why everybody yeah. needs to buy something. So Carl, I want to talk about a couple of things. You did, um, you did a couple of videos with us that were tremendous. Uh, one of them was on nocturne painting. So I want to talk about nocturne painting. Okay. And then the other one was about uh, sunsets. And right. in both of those instances, I learned things. Uh, obviously, you're going to get more from the video than you're going to get visual, you know, because you get the visual. But I learned things from you that I had never heard in 20 years of painting about how light behaves at nighttime uh, how light behaves at sun, sunset. And I assume it's <clears throat> pretty much the same at sunrise, but we'll talk about that. So, um, let's start with sunrises and sunsets. Okay. Um, you know, the big, the big issue, I think for most of <clears throat> us, especially people who haven't, you know, really learned the tricks to that yet is, you know, you get out there and you get that golden light and then everything's gone and you just don't even have a chance to get it all down and you're scrambling, your colors look wrong, they look garish. I'm speaking to myself, of course. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and then, you know, it's, it's over. So yeah. what, what's your preparation process like? Um, well, I can tell you that my preparation process initially involved lots of study. I mean, I actually, I got textbooks. I Googled um, sunrise, sunset. I Googled the physics of atmosphere. And there's a lot of information out there. And it turns out that the better I understood what was going to happen, the more frequently I would see it. And once you see it, you can paint it quick, or once you're able to see it, You'll be able to paint it, but you'll also be able to remember it. So, um, so I, to, to me, it's understanding it helped by helping me prepare in advance uh, with the colors that were going to happen. And then it helped me see the colors as it did happen. And then it helped me remember after the effect was gone. Do, and, you, do you find that they're consistent? I mean, do they ever really uh, change? Well, I think what's confusing to people is that sunset looks so different 
every night that how would you ever have a formula for that? Yeah. But it turns out that the only thing that really makes it different is the clouds or the haze and the way light hits that part of the sky. But the background sky colors are pretty much always the same. And uh, it's because white light, I don't want to lose anybody here, but white light, which is what's emitted by the sun that we can see, is actually composed of the different colors of light, which are the colors of the rainbow. And each of those colors has a different wavelength. And because of that, they, are, they react differently when they hit particles in the atmosphere. So that the more particles that that white light hits, the more you're going to get the longer wavelength light, which is yellowy red light. That's why late sunset, everything turns this kind of golden color because mm -hmm. that's the only color of light that's getting through. Everything else is being scattered away. So there's a scientific formula for it. My, my video, I hope I put it in a sequence that everyone can understand and make it, makes it simple. But just for the purposes of, purposes of today, it's because those colors of light all react differently in the atmosphere. So there so. is a, there's an order though, right? There is, you, you always find that, that certain things happen in the same order. Exactly. And it's the order is what's been referred to as the prismatic sequence. And it's simply the colors of the rainbow in that order. And it goes from long wavelength to short. So it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. And if you look at the sky at sunset or at sunrise, and if there aren't clouds in the way, those are the colors that you'll see. And they may not be vivid colors, but they'll be at least those hues. And you'll, you'll see it at the horizon. You'll see more of a reddish color. And then as you go up, it'll become more orangey yellow and then finally green and then blue. Now, and is it the exact opposite at sun, sunrise? No, it's the exact same at sunrise. It is. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the sequence is the same because... Yeah, but you're upside down. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I like technology. No, it's the same. It's yeah, the okay. same. Uh, some people say that because the sky is usually a little clearer in the morning because all that moisture is kind of dropped out of the sky in the cold of night, that you'll have a little more vivid color in the morning. Well, that so. would explain because I was the next question is that you oftentimes, I oftentimes see more more pinkish colors and purpley colors in the morning than I do in the afternoon. And that would be for that reason, I assume. Because they're they're of a different wavelength. Definitely a different wavelength, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, with that in mind, now you know what the background sky color is. And now you put clouds and haze in there. And clouds can be kind of any color depending on how high they are in the atmosphere. And that again, that formula I kind of go through in my video. Uh, but I guess basically, um, the closer you are to the setting sun, the more you're going to have warm colors in your clouds. And then as you go away, they become cooler. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> it does. Okay. So um, let's talk about the the palette because you talked about the prism, the the rainbow, the the prismatic, the prismatic sequence, sequence, yeah. and you use a prismatic palette. Yes. Now I got my color palette from Joe Paquette, who was my teacher for many years, and he got it from John Osborne, and then it goes up through this lineage to uh, Frank Vincent Dumont, and Frank Vincent Dumont, I think he's given credit for originating a prismatic palette. But all it is, is laying color out in the sequence of a rainbow. So my, I lay out my warm colors, red, orange, yellow. And I lay out my cool colors, kind of a manganese or a cerulean blue to cobalt to ultramarine and then ult, uh, ultraviolet or violet. And uh, so each of the, war the warm colors and the cool colors are each laid out kind of in a sequence of a rainbow. And that's so you can easily access, access them when you're painting a landscape. Because, and this is what Frank Vincent Dumont said, he told his students that silently glowing over this 
entire landscape is a rainbow. You must learn to see it. It is always there. And he was talking about the prismatic sequence in the landscape as you're moving away from, from near to far. Hmm. And uh, the other person who mentions that is um, John F. Carlson in his book. He would say that as you look at landscape and you start looking into the distance, you're going to lose yellow mm -hmm. and things will become bluer. Mm -hmm. And that's because the yellow is a shorter wavelength. And as you go further away, that light has to travel farther through atmosphere so that a yellowy green will now become more of an orangey green and then further away, it becomes more of a reddish green. And you can actually paint it like that, and it'll lay the, the flat plane down nice and uniformly flat uh, to your eye, because that's how we see it. A great way to think of that are sheets of glass with, with spray droplets on it. You know, line up yeah. multiple sheets. But, you know, I, I've often done that when I'm teaching somebody that principle. So yeah. do you, in, in your palette, do you... Uh, lay out a warm and cool of each color? I do not. Um, no, but I, I'm always mindful. Let's say I'm painting greens. I'm painting a bunch of trees going backwards or going into the distance. I will start with kind of a, a yellowy green. I'll mix my cad yellow light with ultramarine blue. I get a nice, rich, yellowy green. And then if I see a similar tree another 100 yards in the distance, I'll start mixing a little bit of orange in with that, and then eventually a little bit of red into it and so forth, and it'll, it'll regress then as I'm looking at this row of trees going into the distance. And I thought so, you were gonna say you'd blue, make them bluer, but these are, uh, trees, these are trees that are in sunlight. So that confused me for a long time. Uh, what, what loses yellow and becomes redder is the light that you're looking at, so an illuminated portion of a tree. What's getting bluer are the shadows. So where there isn't light, you're gonna see local color, let's say in a, in a shadow of a tree up close, and that'll become bluer as you go back. So you're kind of working light and, and shadow at the same time. And that's why Carlson said, you lose yellow and you get gain blue. Well, you're gaining blue in the shadows and you're losing yellow in the lights. Carlson has a great chart in his book uh, that shows that. So it's really wonderful. Yeah. So, um, and the reason you've laid them out in the in the rainbow is is because it helps you uh, mix them more based on the color wheel, or is it is it just a preference thing? I don't understand that. Um, you know, you could have them scattered on your palette in different areas, but I typically move so commonly from a yellow to an orange to a red that to I have see. them lined up in sequence is helpful. Okay. And, and the part I haven't mentioned is that, you know, I've, I've just kind of explained how I use a prismatic palette during the day, but it really comes into play when you're painting nocturnes and yeah. sunsets. Because sunset, as I just talked about, that is the prismatic sequence in the sky, and you can easily transition between those layers by just going down your, your paint piles, down your palette. Uh, and then the other time is when you're doing uh, a nocturne, and you have, let's say, an artificial light illuminating, let's say, the road underneath it, and it's kind of a yellowy light. You're going to have more yellow directly beneath where the light is, where most direct light hits. And as you move away, as it gets darker, you don't just put less and less yellow. You start mixing it with some oranges and some reds down the sequence. And so I guess to summarize that, I would say as value drops off, there's also going to be a color shift that is prismatic, going from a, the lighter uh, part of the prism to a darker part of the prism. So the tendency that I had before I learned this from you was uh, I would typically put um, a, a white, almost a pure white, to, you know, like a highlight in the middle of that street lamp and maybe a touch of yellow. But 
you've you actually have figured out you know how to create a sense of of making that glow right is that essentially using the same principles it's exactly the same principle there's a prismatic color shift as as the light drops off so you are correct to put a little bit of white right where the light source was yeah but beyond the the white at the light source i almost never use white when i'm showing this glow around the light because the glow the light has to be so much brighter than the glow now here's an example uh so you can see there's white in this light and as you move away from it it's it's yellow but keep going further away you can actually see there's going to be some red in the dark shadows of those trees and and all of that glow on a grayscale is probably five or six instead of the the light itself which is about a one so, so the so when when you're uh, painting a sunset, uh, you know now what the colors are going to be. You know what the the spectrum uh, is going to look like, the sequence. But are you are you laying out um, like you're drawing in advance? Are you painting part of it in in advance? Uh, what? Yeah, because things tend to get a little silhouette-y. Well, they do, and actually, that's not a bad thing uh, if you know you're going to paint let's say late sunset or early dusk or even late dusk, you can go out to your site ahead of time and do a drawing and you can do a silhouette. But the minute you start trying to put the light that you're currently seeing ahead of time into the ground plane, it's going to look way too light later on. Yeah. And, and part of that is just knowing what's going to happen. If you go out at uh, dusk, and look at the foreground landmass, it's going to look like a dark silhouette, even though 30 minutes earlier it didn't. So I just go out and I draw it as a silhouette, and I put it in in dark paint, and then I wait for the exact moment of sunset that I like, and I'll put that background sky color in, and then as fast as I can do it, I'll start putting those clouds and the cloud color in, and if there's any time left, I will start putting in a little bit of additional light in that silhouette ground plane. And but, but you can actually keep painting once the sun goes down because you kind of know what's going to happen or right. what did happen. I mean, to, to actually paint what's actually there, you've got to at least have that 20-minute time frame where you are trying to paint exactly what you see. Mm -hmm. but, you, um, but as soon as that's done, as soon as that light effect goes away, don't keep chasing the light. Now you've got to remember it. But if you're still standing there and you've got a nocturne light on your, on your painting, you can keep working on that sunset painting because with knowledge, you know what that had looked like. And it helps you remember it. So when you're so painting in your silhouette, <clears throat> or, and you said paint it with a dark, are you painting with a cool dark or a warm dark? Uh, again, uh, uh, kind of a foreknowledge of what's going to happen, where that sun went down, that landmass, that silhouette is going to be warmer than it is as you move away from the setting sun. So I typically use a warm, kind of a brownish-red color near where the sun has gone down to paint in my silhouette. And I, as I move off to the side, that becomes cooler. I'll start adding blues to that, blues or greens. All right. Well, I think we've covered that subject well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we have, a, nothing, we have nothing else to talk about. <laughs> well, listen. It's, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very complicated subject, but it's uh, well worth learning because I actually have so much fun painting night scenes and uh, sunsets now that I kind of force myself to do the other, other paintings as well. Well, you have a to... scientific mind, you know, having yeah. been an MD and a surgeon, you, you know, you know science. And so... Uh, learning that science really so sounds like it has benefited you and certainly benefited me. I actually have, have made a little chart that I just carry with me in my, in my uh, case, just to remind myself until it gets to the point where I've done it enough times, I'll remember it. Yeah. But I think it makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing we've, we, you know, we've done another podcast with you in the past. We didn't have video at the time for those who are watching on video go back and you can hear the audio, but, um, you know, we've talked a lot about your career and so on, but 
I thought it would be kind of nice also to talk about some of the painters who have inspired you in the past, because I think that's so important. You know, we, we all have a tendency to say the same two or three people. And and I suspect that some of those people inspired you as well, but what are the ones that, that we don't talk about very much that have inspired you? Okay. Yeah. I, I could easily uh, name all the ones that you're thinking of that, that everyone mentions and it would be true that they are inspirations to me, but I guess um, one that a lot of people don't know is that when I was in college, I was an art minor and I mainly did pencil drawing and specifically I did kind of a pointillist style of pencil mm-hmm. drawing. Mm-hmm. And one of my heroes back then was um, MC Escher. Oh, fabulous. And yeah, there's one. Um, so that's the kind of way I put graphite down was in, I kind of used a pointless style. I kind of rubbed it in. And in a way, I think it's closer to painting than classical drawing where it's mainly done in line. But the other thing I liked about Escher was beyond the image itself, there was a lot of interest in what was going on in the painting kind of a narrative, or in the drawing. Uh, he had a lot of narrative stuff going on and, and some kind of uh, optical tricks. And to me, uh, that was fascinating. So whether or not I accomplish some of those things in my own work, I don't know, but I do kind of tend to like that kind of uh, narrative style, I guess. Yeah, he must have been doing some good drugs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> he was just amazing. I, I was yeah. very into him as a teenager. Uh, I still have those books and, and, you know, yeah. you'd study them because you, you could look at them for a long period of time and discover things in them. And I think that's also kind of the mark of a good painting. You know, I used right. to, I used to, I think I told you this, I'd take my kids when they were little, you know, four or five years old. And I'd want to go to a museum when I was, when I was taking care of them on the weekends. And I mean, we had them all the time, but mom needed a break. <clears throat> and so I'd take them with a sketch pad each and I'd say, okay, Find a painting here in the museum that you like, sit on the floor and draw it. And the one thing they always said is, well, first off, they complained. They didn't want to do it. And then after uh, it was time to go, it was like, Dad, we don't want to go. We keep seeing more and more things in these paintings. How do you create little, uh, I like to call them Easter eggs, elements of surprise? What, What are you thinking about when you're creating that composition? Yeah, um, I guess I've I've had a couple of paintings where I specifically wanted to put something almost hidden that you'd have to look around for a while to see it. Um, And especially in a night scene, for instance, Mm -hmm. uh, because there's so much contrast between the lit area and the dark area that it's easy by just changing your value a little bit to hide a figure or something in the dark area. And I kind of get a kick out of doing that. So you, you'd probably see a few of those in my work. Okay. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, the big shapes kind of define your composition. And once you have that well-defined, you can put those little little highlights yeah. or little details anywhere you want in the painting, really. Did you start painting before you started studying with Joe Paquette? Or did was he your beginner, your your teacher from the beginning? Um, well, I, like I said, I was an art minor in college, so I definitely had tried painting, um, but I was kind of drawn to this drawing thing. And then my wife is a painter, and she's, of course, a big influence of mine. And so even before I started taking from Joe, I was kind of experimenting with paint. And then uh, she ended up taking classes with Joe, and she, she said, this is about 20 years ago, she said, you know, if you want to get back into your art, why don't you take classes from this guy too? And uh, I did. So that's how it started for me. Yeah. And I've always wished I lived in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area for that very reason. What a great teacher. Yeah. He, will, he will go down historically as a great, I truly yeah. believe. Yeah. So I've, I've, go ahead. Go, no, you go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I've mentioned before that, uh, Joe was my main teacher, but over the years, I've done workshops and uh, classes with other artists as well, which I find helpful to get 
input from different styles. Yeah. And, and then I decide which ones I want to incorporate into my painting. But it definitely was great foundation to, to have Joe at the start. Do you struggle with anything now? Oh, man. I, I look at uh, Instagram and I go to these events and I'm just amazed at how good painters are. It really and, is. Uh, it's a yeah, wonderful it's time amazing. to be alive. Yeah. So, yeah, I struggle. Um, but I have become more consistent now more recently. So that if I go to an event, I might scrap one painting out of 10 or so. Yeah, that's a pretty good uh, average. Yeah, but in the in the old days, it was I kept my fingers crossed that I would have something at the end. <laughs> Is there any particular thing? I, I was talking to somebody recently, no names, but a uh, pretty well-known painter, and I asked him that question, and he said, well, you know, the one thing I really struggle with are my skies. And so I said, well, how'd you deal with that? He says, well, I tried to figure out who was the best sky painter out there, and I, I went and took a workshop. And this is somebody who, you know, who, who you would never think of as, as doing that, but putting, putting yourself out there and trying to better yourself, I think is always, always good. Oh yeah. i uh, like five years ago, I think I, I wanted to learn how to paint rocks better. And I took Mark Bogus's workshop out in Arizona mm. and uh, it was interesting. He, I, I love how he paints them. So I, I learned a few things. So how do you uh, make sure when you're teaching students that they are not becoming, um, excuse the expression, Carl Jr.? <clears throat> I mean, they can become whatever they want to become. <laughs> uh, I don't, uh, I don't, I haven't seen it happen, honestly, but uh, because everyone has their own, some, some, some connection in their brain that makes them pain a certain way. You see sometimes and, uh, where, where there's somebody who has a very, very uh, noticeable visual style and yeah. they do a lot of workshops and they get a lot of people who are knocking off that style. And yeah. I just, I, you know, I don't know if that's by design or if, if they're encouraging that or if that's just happening because people happen to love it. So, yeah. So I've got a, a friend uh, who paints in a very loose impressionistic style. And I really wanted to paint like that. And uh, so for a couple of years, my work kind of looked like that a little bit. And then eventually I just tightened up again to a more refined brush stroke or whatever. And I, I just decided I'm just gonna go with that because it just feels like me. Yeah. And I, I think that if people do, you know, mimic a style, it probably won't be forever. It'll just be, for as long as they're thinking about it and eventually they'll paint like themselves. Do you find that you ever get bored and you're just like, okay, I, I'm, I need to just shake it up and do something completely different, different approach, different style, or do you, you know, that happens to me. Uh, I'll, you know, the, I, I have the, the blessing and the curse of being able to have all you folks staying here at the world famous artist cabin yeah. and, and, and the studio, you know, and it's like, oh man, I got to do that. And then I'll start doing that for a couple of weeks. And then somebody else will come in and I'll start doing that. I finally had to stop going to the shoots because it was screwing me up so badly. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> again, if I ever go to another instructor and try to learn something, I'm trying to learn something very basic, not, yeah. not, not how they <clears throat> flick their brush or whatever. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we talked about uh, Escher who else would be on that list of inspirations that are not going to be the Sergeant Soroya, uh, Zorn, you know, the, okay. the big three. Well, I, I was hoping you wouldn't mention my other big three then. Cause I, um, uh, besides Escher, um, I'd say Edward Hopper. And it's because when I was a child, uh, my aunt would, my mother and my aunt would switch children every week or so, or one week a month. And we'd go into Minneapolis and we'd, she would take us to all these art museums. And I think Hopper had a, he had uh, quite a few at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis for a while. So I remember seeing those paintings and it got to the point where my aunts would then give me posters of Hopper paintings uh, when I was in high school. Mm, nice. When our Christmas came around or something. So uh, it was someone I got really used to, to looking at. And, um, and I liked his sense of light, everything. You could see a light coming from somewhere. You could see the actual 
uh, fall off of light in a night scene. So it's things that I, I still try to copy today a little bit. Also a brilliant storyteller. Yeah, he was very a narrative style of painting. And, and often without, the, without a narrative without an answer. I mean, you kind of can make up whatever you thought was going on. Are you trying to do yeah. some of that? A little bit. Sometimes I have. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I, I get that, that sense a lot in your nocturne paintings. It's kind of a, you know, it's like you're trying to tell a story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess another one, uh, Ed, I haven't known about his work for that long, but Edward Sego. I, I think he paints with just the right amount of uh, detail. In the UK, right? Seagull? I'm not sure if he's UK or if he's Italian. I don't know. Yeah. Not, our viewers will know. Yeah. Edward Seagull. Yeah. Um, and then Arthur Streeton, Australian painter. I admire his work. He, mm -hmm. he, he keys everything very light compared to my work. Uh, and I'm always impressed at how people can do that and have it still look uh, accurate, but he does it very well. Uh, and then Russian painters. We have the Russian Museum in town. We've talked oh, about this so at the last lucky. podcast. So lucky. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I've, I've actually been to the warehouse and seen a lot of the paintings that aren't shown there, but are, uh, rotate through there. And it's just amazing the consistency of these Russian painters and how, how great their work is, not only in drawing and value and things like that, but uh, their brush handling. Everyone knows how to put enough paint down, which is something I struggle with sometimes. They're so well trained. They yeah. Just, just uh, blow me away. I, I, you know, it's, and, and I knew nothing about these guys until I, I mean, somebody tried to tell me and I looked them up, but when I saw those works in person, it just, I had tears yeah. in my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and among those, I guess, Isaac Levitan and uh, Ivan Shishkin, probably my favorites. Mm -hmm. And, and I, one thing Joe Paquette used to say about Levitan is that uh, everything was put down for a reason. He didn't, he didn't put anything down just to be stylish. You know, he, he just, saw what what was there he wanted to paint it accurately and he just put it down the best way that he could and uh, i guess that's how, kind of how i feel like i paint now i'm just trying to capture the scene uh put down accurate color accurate value and it turns out the way they do what more could you ask for yeah <laughs> so what have you got coming up what's on your your agenda for the next few months <clears throat> well i'm going to see you in denver uh, oh, you'll be at the at, convention. End of May, yep, I'll be at the convention. Um, and then in the fall, I've got uh, kind of a lineup of things. I've got the Catalina Wild Side Show out in Newport Beach and Laguna Plein Air Invitational. Uh, and we have a local event, Grand Marais Plein Air, which is a fun one for us. Uh, and then a PAPA event, Plein Air Painters of America event out in Santa Fe. Oh, that'll so, be yeah, lovely. And I like being home in the summer, so I don't, I'm kind of oh, happy. Oh, your I've summers are so, you're so short up there. <laughs> they are. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, so um, I was going to ask you one other question. It escaped me, but, oh, I, I was, um, oh, I was going to ask you your perceptions of the convention from an outside perspective. From the first time you went, um, <clears throat> I, th I think people sometimes don't understand what it's all about. And when I say it, it's, it's, uh, they're like, okay, you're hyping it. What, yeah. uh, what, what is it about that event that you find to be so special? Okay. Um, well, I'm a good one to ask because I've been to every one except the very first one, which was Have you really, thank you. Yeah. Was it Las Vegas? Was that the first one? Mm -hmm. I can't remember. But anyway, from two onward, I've been there and, uh, I go because my friends go, for one thing, mm -hmm. and we've made a lot of new friends there. Uh, so I guess the social aspect of it is kind of number one for me. Yeah. But then the, you, know, you can spend a lot of money to go to different workshops, 
But here, for the price of one workshop or even less than one workshop, you get teaching from all these multiple, you know, great instructors. So it's, it's nothing to, I, I'm not making it up. It's to me, it's like a great value in, uh, in plein air instruction. Or in you know, I look at it like a, you know, you used to go to the candy store, they'd have these, what was it, Whitman samplers or something. You get a little yeah. piece of all these different chocolates. Yeah. And <clears throat> I've had people tell me that they thought they wanted to study under a particular instructor. And then they watched their two hour demo on stage and they said, you know, this person's not the right fit for me, but they found five or six others that were the right fit. So yeah. I think it's a great, great way to kind of see what works for you. Yeah. The uh, expo hall where they have all the merchandise too is uh, every, you can tell everyone loves it because it's just packed all the time, but you know, you can see what's new in the plein air world. You can talk to people who actually make the brushes and yeah, it's, I a, think, it's a, I think I it's like the fun. communication that goes on in there. Mm -hmm. It's fun to see, you know, all of a sudden, you know, people are setting up in the expo hall or they're in the hallways and, you know, there's people painting everywhere indoors and then yeah. going outdoors together. I think that's, that's, that's a hoot. And this year is going to yeah. be, really special because we're going to be painting where Beerstadt painted in the Rocky Mountain National Park, which was not easy to, to make happen. So right. probably never happen again, but at least this one time. So we're pretty happy about that. Well, Carl, Colorado's, thank you. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go I was going to say, well, I look forward to going to Colorado. I, I graduated from the University of Colorado in Boulder with my minor in fine art. And I only regret that I never painted uh the area back when i was doing that i i, I would draw it sometimes i use color pencil but i would sure like to have done it as a painter as well well it should stay a couple extra days there's plenty to paint yeah and where'd you go to medical school back at the university of minnesota okay yeah all right well carl That's thanks cool. for being on again today i want to remind everybody there's a previous podcast carl bretzky was on five years ago and uh, that talks a lot about his history and background, a lot of other things as well. So you want to check that out as, as well. And Carl's videos, uh, Sunset Secrets and also Nocturnes Painting the Night uh, are available at PaintTube.tv. Carl's, uh, let's see, CarlBretzke.com, B-R-E-T-Z-K-E.com. And... Uh, at Carl Bretzky Art on Instagram. And uh, let's see, Carl.Bretzky on Facebook, right? Did I get it right? I guess so. Oh, hope so. <laughs> Me too. Hey, yeah. You guys give Carl a follow yeah. because it's fun to see what he's doing and see his paintings. Carl, I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. All see right. you later. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, now we're going to get to the art marketing questions and answer some of your questions in the Art Marketing Minute. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. So my goal is to help you. I've been marketing my entire life, which is a long, long time. Uh, and I learned a lot about marketing and I did not learn about art marketing. And so the principles that I teach really are not art marketing principles. They're just standard marketing principles, right? I mean, I, I have picked it up over the years, helping a lot of artists, uh, helping some of them uh, become just super successful, hopefully. Uh, anyway, if you want to make a great living, Art Marketing Minute is a good place to help you do that. You can email your questions, eric at artmarketing.com. <clears throat> or if you uh, you want to send in a video, we have a video. First timer. All right. We have a video. Let's let's run with it. Hello, Eric and Amandine. I'm Maris Gauthier from uh, Can uh, Canada. I started painting in February 2017 to overcome my phobia of painting. But four months after I started painting, I was commissioned for an art piece just by showing uh, r random little projects I was working on. After selling that first piece, the idea that I, I could eventually maybe make a business with my art 
And so I, I decided to do this. I sold two uh, small eight by eight paintings for uh, 1,370. I have a website where I sell prints and, and merchandise too, but it's not really, it, it didn't really get started. The problem is I'm getting self-conscious. Uh, it seems that I was more naive and doing things more spontaneously, but as I go, I, I realize that I'm selling at higher prices than than most would do, and hearing art professionals saying that you can't sell for higher than that when you start. And so I'm wondering, is it can it be detrimental for me to sell at those prices? Don't let them get you down. <laughs> the, the, one of the first and important principles that I learned in business is that everybody always tells you all the things you can't do. You can't do this because it's not done that way. You can't do that because nobody does that. Just ignore it. You know, just follow your heart and do what you believe in. Um, there's not a right or wrong. Uh, there's not a manual. Uh, I've tried to write one, but you know, there's really not a manual. Most, uh, most importantly is you put yourself out there. You started out at a higher price. Um, you're getting a decent price for first time paintings out there. You mentioned, um, I think you said 900 or more, um, and you've sold some. So, What's wrong with that? There is nothing wrong with that. Now, I can understand why some people might say, well, you got to start out slow and just start, you know, edge up. Why? Why edge up? Why should you have to do that? Now, a gallery might want to say, look, we have to edge you up and build a collector base and then increase your prices over time. That's where that thinking probably comes from. You're not selling through a gallery, you're selling direct. And you don't want to sell in a gallery. I'm going to talk about that later, but uh, that's that's just fine. So um, you said that the uh, in in your original comment, I don't think you said it in the video, but I read your question too, and that is you said that $900 is a lot of money. Well, it is a lot of money to some people, but it's not a lot of money to other people, right? So we tend to get hung up on perceptions of money. A lot of artists do this. Um, the big problem that I have constantly, I'm constantly coaching artists to say, look, your prices are too low. I, I had a world famous artist staying in the world famous artist cabin recently. And I said, how much are these paintings? And she told me, and I said, wrong. The, you, the, you, they should be selling for four or five, six times this amount of money and they'll sell. Well, I don't know. I don't think so. And I said, no, 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 you, you have to have that confidence. They're fabulous. You don't realize the, the importance of your, your ability and your career. So we get hung up on these perceptions of money. Um, if, especially if we never had money, right? So the one thing that we, as many of us as artists never grew up with anything, and so, uh, you know, so to us, you know, spending $900 on a painting may not be possible or may not something we want to do. And, but yet uh, there are people who will drop 900 bucks like you and I would drop a 10. And, and so you have to understand that. Now, the key to this is environment. Environment plays a huge role in selling. If you're selling at a flea market, uh, you know, you're going to have to, uh, $10 is a lot at the flea market, right? You're not going to sell a Rolls Royce at the flea market. Rolls Royce is going to be where they're going to be at the Palm beach art show or the LA art show, or they're going to be where the money hangs out at the country club or whatever, you know, they're looking for environment. Environment makes a difference. Well, why aren't you looking for environment? Sounds like you already found it. You found people willing to spend money. So there's lots of different levels in money, right? So, um, you know, my cardiologist is probably a really wealthy guy, but he's not wealthy compared to Elon Musk, right? I can't imagine. 
Um, but he's still a wealthy guy. I mean, there's, there's different levels of wealth. I have a, a buddy that I grew up with who has become, I'd say probably a billionaire, pretty close to a billionaire. You know, he'll, he'll drop 40, $50,000, uh, over dinner with, uh, movie stars and people like that. Uh, and you know, buying $10,000 bottles of champagne. I mean, it's just money to him. And, and so it doesn't affect him. I, you know, I'm not doing that. <laughs> But um, that's why hitting money targets is so important if you're selling works that you want to price well. I've had dealers tell me that my magazine, Fine Art Connoisseur, has sold million-dollar paintings. And because we have like three, 400 billionaires who read it. Um, and I, I sold, uh, I had a real estate company sell a $20 million house from two ads in that magazine and the, the person who bought responded to the, one of those two ads and ended up, it was $20 million house. And that was 10 years ago. It's probably equivalent of a hundred million dollar house today. And it was by the way, a billionaire. So you just never know. You got to be in the environment. So where you advertise matters, uh, where you hang out matters, where you, uh, you know, they always talk about, uh, the people you hang with influence how you are. You know, if you want to sell to rich people, you need to learn about them. You need to hang out with them, figure out, you know, go, go do a, a lessons at the country club or something. So, um, you know, rich people don't need bargains. Everybody wants bargains, but they don't need bargains. Uh, some people need bargains. So, um, your question is it detrimental in the long term? No, probably not. I think um, right now you've only sold two, three, four paintings at these prices, but you've got a consistent track record. So now what you got to do is figure out how to sell more paintings if that's important to you. And it might not be, but to increase volume, uh, you might lower price. But there's something people don't understand. There's a great book. I wish I could remember the name of it. It's on pricing. And it says that if you reduce your price by 10%, let's say you have something that's $100, you reduce it by to $90, you have to sell 18% more volume to make up the amount of money. So be careful with that because otherwise you'll price yourself out. Um, I think higher prices are generally good. Uh, you need to build a brand. A brand helps you get a higher price. Now, brands have different meaning. McDonald's is a brand. That's a low price brand. Uh, Louis Vuitton is a high price brand. Uh, so you need to figure out what brand do I want to be? Where do I build my brand? How do I build it? Where do I stand out? Where, where do I want people to see my, my ads, my stories, things like that? Because you want to be where the rich people are. If you're selling to rich people, if you want to, you want to sell to school teachers and you know, who, who are not going to spend $900. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to be a little school teachers is not my point, but the idea is, um, you know, then advertise someplace that they're reading. But the idea is that you want to, um, you want to go where stand in the money, where the river is flowing. As I always say, uh, look, uh, you need to feel that you deserve it. And you did that. You set a price because you feel you deserve it. Bravo for you. You tried it. It worked. Congratulations. Now raise your prices more. Keep going up and see how see it, where you get price resistance. You know, if you you go from nine hundred to ten thousand, you might get price resistance. I was once in a gallery and I said I want to be the most expensive person in the gallery, and they said, "But you, nobody knows who you are." I said, "I know that, but somebody's going to walk in there and they're going to see two paintings and they're going to see one that's ten thousand dollars and one that's two thousand dollars, and they like them both, but." The one that's $10,000 must be better. I couldn't get the gallery owner to agree to it, so I don't know what, what would happen. Anyway, good job. Congratulations. I'm proud of you. Keep it up. All right, next question, Amandine. The next question is from Laura from Berlin, Maryland. How does one get into a gallery when you're not an already established artist? I'm told not to approach a gallery, but how else can one do it? Well, you know, again, uh, just because I say something doesn't make it true. And I have some strong feelings about this. And I have strong feelings because I was sitting in a gallery one day 
gallery owner said, do you mind while we talk, I go through the mail and he's going through mail. Uh, it was actually kind of rude, actually, now that I think about it, but, uh, he's going through mail. I said, what are you looking at? He's, he'd look at peeking something and throw it away, peeking something, throw it away. And he had a stack, a big stack. I said, what are you going through? He says, oh, we get, uh, 50, a hundred submissions a week. And I feel obligated to open them in case there's something in there that I should see. Uh, but he says, I don't even look at the artwork. I, you know, I can't do it. He says, I get hundreds of emails soliciting the gallery. I have people, he says, I was the other day, I was in front of a customer. The customer is ready to buy in walks. This guy, he interrupts us and he says, Hey, you know, I'm kind of interested in being in your gallery. I'd like to talk to you about that. And meanwhile, the customer walks off. He loses the sale, right? He says, I don't want somebody walking into my gallery to talk to me about this stuff. You know, it, the reality is that galleries, um, are there a business, right? They're busy. And what questions do galleries ask themselves? Here are a couple of them. Um, is this artist good? Is this artist consistent? Do they have a body of work? Can they do one good painting or can they do hundreds of good paintings? Um, because I have to sell a lot of work. I can't make a living from one artist and one painting typically. Will it sell? What price will it sell for? Is it a price that fits my price point in the gallery? Is it too low? Is it too high? You know, uh, and how much is my wall space worth? You know, shelf space and wall space is worth something. I got I if I have a small gallery and I got to need a, you know, let's say a $100,000 a month, I and I can put 10 paintings up. I know I have to be able to get $10,000 a month out of each of those paintings that are hanging there. That's wall space, right? So can I make it with this artist? Can they do it? Do people know your brand? Do they know who you are? Is this artist selling well elsewhere? What's the evidence of that? Can I make a lot of money on her? Can I make a lot of money on her over the next 5, 10, 20 years? And I had a gallery owner say, you know, I told him about an artist he says, yeah, I'm aware of that artist, but quite frankly, um, I, you know, he's good. He's very good, but I don't think I can get 20 years of business out of him. So I would rather invest in somebody that's going to be around for 20 years. Sad, but true. So, you know, everybody thinks differently. So now if you do want to go through and be in a gallery, and by the way, there's no rule that says you have to be, I like the idea of having a gallery. I have three of them. Uh, and I like it because they're talking to me, they're talking about me, they're selling me when I'm sleeping, right? And I don't have to do all that work. Now, I don't sell anything direct, I don't have time. I barely have time to paint for the galleries. I have scarcity, I have that, because I don't have much in the galleries. And they probably don't push me very much because they know they're not gonna, I'm not gonna give them enough stuff. But uh, if you wanna be, then uh, keep in mind a couple of things. First off, you are handing your future over to a gallery, which I think is stupid. Now, I'm not an anti-gallery. I love galleries. But what I mean is don't rely 100% on any gallery. First off, you want to spread your risk. You want to have two or three, ideally, minimum. Some people don't. But if if you're going to have exclusivity with a single gallery, you know, then you want to be in some place like Forum in New York or Acadia Gallery in New York because they are going to make you a lot of money if they get behind you. Um, and so you want to make sure that you still have control. You want to make sure you control the circumstances, the deal, the stakes. You got to motivate them. You got to help them. You got to cooperate with them. You got to brand yourself still, control your branding. You got to have other outlets to sell if they let you. Some artists will have like a certain category or a certain amount of money. Uh, so you've got to control everything because the minute you lose control, if they, all of a sudden they stop working for you, you've got a bigger problem, right? So you don't want to have that. So I would say if you want to be in a gallery, I, I like the idea of getting invited in and the way to get invited in, I go into excruciating detail in my book, but the, the, the essence of it is find somebody who knows them, Ask them to evaluate your work. Ask them if you feel that you would be a good fit for their gallery. And if they do, ask them if they would be 
willing to mention you to somebody. Don't push it. Uh, you know, and, and you have to, you're calling a favor. So you got to be kind of careful about that, but that's overall one of the best ways. Now, here's the other trick that nobody realizes, which is probably the biggest way that galleries find artists. Well, it used to be, uh, just ads. Now it's Instagram, Facebook. That's why I always say, don't post unfinished paintings and don't post your bad paintings. You know, we all do bad paintings. Don't post your bad paintings. Why? Because not, you know, people are flipping through and they see a bad painting and they see your name. What do they do? They say, oh, Eric's does bad paintings. So put your best work out there. And then of course, uh, we have, I had a dealer I interviewed one time and he said, I watch who's advertising in your magazines. And I said, why? He said, because I want people who are committed to their career. They're so committed that they're willing to spend money to brand themselves to try and sell on their own. And also they're going to eventually keep spending money and they're going to mention my gallery in their ads and I'll mention them in my ads. And so it's a, it's a win-win. And he says, I've got this one guy. I've had my eye on him for five years. He says, I'm about to go with him. His work was a little inconsistent, uh, but it's getting better and better. And now I'm about to go with him. So be patient. You know, there are people watching you don't know, know or watching. So, um, I've also seen galleries, and this is the thing I, I alluded to earlier, and that is that I've seen galleries who have uh, decided not to work with established artists. What? Why would that be? Well, there are people out there who established themselves, you know, 10, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. They became big deals. They were known. They were household words, were household names in the art industry. And they're no longer keeping up. They're no longer promoting themselves, no longer doing shows, no longer doing ads uh, because they were, they thought they could rest on their laurels. But the reality is that unless you stay at the forefront, you're no longer going to sell. I heard from an artist who he called me one day. He says, you know, five years ago, seven, 10 years ago, he says, I was making so much money. I was selling just, I couldn't believe it. Uh, and I said, well, what are you doing now? Are you doing ads? No. Why, why should I do ads? Everybody knows who I am. I said, are you doing shows? No, nah, it's too much work. Everybody knows who I am. You know, went through the whole thing. And, and, and I said, they've forgotten you. You know, there's a thing called attrition, right? So uh, every year, a gallery loses 10% of their audience. Every year, an, an artist loses 10% of their buyers, right? Attrition. People die. People move. People retire. People don't buy paintings anymore. People get sick. People change their taste. You know, there's a lot of things that happen. And so that's 10% a year. In 2008, when a bad economy happened, it was like 60% in one year, right? So you have to constantly be bringing new people in, and galleries have to do that. And that's why people keep advertising, because you're always bringing people in. You know, if you, you lay low for 10 years, you're going to feel it. You're going to feel it after a year, quite frankly. You feel it after six months. I, I have a, a very well-known artist who, who advertised with us, and the discussion was, well, I think I've been advertising a long enough time. I'm just going to stop. And I said, okay, that's fine. Here's what's going to happen. Oh, no, that'll never happen. Everybody knows who I am. I said, okay. Six months later, phone rings. You were right. Phone stopped ringing. Galleries stopped calling. Sales stopped happening. I said, right. Out of sight, out of mind. Anyway, those are some thoughts on galleries. Bottom line is you got to build your brand. You got to control your brand. You got uh, to get invited. That's best. Don't just barge in. If you do decide you're going to go that route, at least email, call, try to get an appointment and explain to them the answers to those questions, why you're a good investment, why they're going to sell, give them evidence, let them watch you. Um, and also make sure you're producing the best possible work you can. You know, some of you are not gallery ready and some of you think you are, you know, it's just something you've got to get advice from other people to find out. Anyway, that is today's art marketing minute. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. Okay, I want to remind you guys to come to Pace in Denver, the Plein Air Convention. If you can't come in person, come online. 
you can sign up. Uh, it's uh, our 10 year birthday. We're bringing birthday gifts for everybody. And uh, Jane Seymour is coming to help us celebrate CW Monday, Alvaro Cassinet, and you know many, 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 many others. Laurie Putnam, Jane Hunt. Uh, I can't even remember all of them. Let's see if I can remember some more. Camille Preswadic, Christine Lashley, Daniel Sprick, uh, Don Demers, uh, Joanna Arnett. You want to be there. It's the 10th birthday, May 21st through 25. And there's a pre-convention workshop with Laurie Putnam on the 24th. 20th and a beginner's day or a essential day we call it now on the 21st also so come to the convention and uh also would love you guys to subscribe to plein air magazine if you're not we'd love to have you pleinairmagazine.com i have a blog on sunday mornings uh if you haven't got it just go to coffeewitheric.com and get it and uh, it comes to you every sunday morning by email all right also i'm on the air daily on facebook and uh, YouTube, it's called Art School Live. We do art lessons every day. Love to have you there. Just go to uh, YouTube and look for Art School Live and hit that subscribe button so when we go live, you are notified, okay? And please give me a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Always appreciate that. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. Bye-bye. This has been the Plen Air Podcast with Plen Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plen Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook. 240 plein air painting tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening. <laughs>